All right, welcome to CS uh, uh, 4510. I believe this is uh, L13A, and this is uh, the art of reduction. So last time we proved something in very important. We proved two very important things. We proved uh, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is that there exists unprovable statements. Uh, and then we also proved Alan Turing's wor work on the halting problem. There exists an undecidable problem. There exists a problem such that it can be defined, it has a definition, yet no algorithm exists to decide that language, right? Um, the next question you should have is like, what else is there to do? Uh, we, the halting problem was a collection of strings such that each string is an encoding of a machine and a word such that the machine halts on the word. M halts on W, right? That was the halting problem. But it turns out, what else? We can't determine if a machine halts on a, on a single input in general or not. But we can um, do, what else can't we do, right? That's basically the next question. ATM is a language, not the halting problem for, for Turing machines, but the acceptance problem for Turing machines. Given uh, M comma W, shows that M accepts W. Now, this is slightly different than the halting problem because if a machine halts, it either accepts or rejects. Uh, if a machine accepts, it always halts. But if a machine doesn't accept it, that doesn't mean it rejected it. It could have looped on it, right? ATM is the language of machines and words such that M accepts W. In fact, this is going to be a more useful language as we do proofs today than the halting problem. Um, do you think ATM is decidable or undecidable? Can you give me a decider for ATM? Certainly you can determine if M accepts W by running M on W. How do you determine if M loops on W or rejects W? Well, you wait for it to reject. How do you know if M loops on W? You, don't, you can't determine this, right? So in fact, these two languages can be related to one another. Um, assume to the contrary. ATM is decidable. We give a decider for halt. Here's, by the way, a kind of a more interesting general thing that happens in computer science. When you do proofs by contradictions, you say, well, the proof by contradiction implies the existence of a certain algorithm for something. So even when you're showing non-existence of certain problems, you're still writing code, right? So we'll give this, we'll call this decider H, and we want H to correctly decide the halting problem. It takes on input uh, m comma w. And this is sort of how we will write our pseudocode. We'll, we'll the function name, the Turing machine on input, and then the input is going to be a pair of machine and word. Um, we know that we have a, a, a uh, decider for ATM. So we'll build the halting decider around the decider for ATM. Uh, if uh, m comma w is an element of ATM, except else, by the way, what does this really mean? Assume to the contrary there's a decider for ATM, call it A, run M comma W on that decider, and that decider will always say yes or no. So if else, branch on what that decider says. We can only do this step by the assumption to the contrary, right? Now, else, if it doesn't, if M comma W is not an ATM, we know that M either loops on W or rejects W. So we can determine if it rejects W by uh, just flipping the states. Um, if uh, we say build M prime from M swapping QA and QR, so we take the two, the single accept state, the single reject state, swap them around. Okay. Um, if m prime comma w is an element of ATM, except else reject. So uh, basically, if m accepts w, we accept. If m rejects w. We accept because M halts on W. 
And if m does not accept, and we know m does not reject, it must loop. We can conclude then that m must be in the loop. So we may simply say reject. Now this is therefore a decider for halt. Contradiction, we know such, no such decider can exist. Therefore, ATM is also undecidable. Right. Is ATM recognizable? Recall the definition of a language to be recognizable is if there's basically a semi-decider for it. A language is recognizable if there exists a Turing machine which is right on the good inputs, but is allowed to loop or reject on the bad inputs. Can you give me an algorithm that determines if m accepts w that it does correctly say yes, but if m does not accept w, then it does say yes or no? Excuse me, it does loop or it says rejects? Yeah, here's the recognizer R. Uh, simulate M on W. If it accepts, accept. Uh, so we'll say R on input uh, M comma W. Simulate M on W. This is done with the universal Turing machine. If M accepts, W, accept. Notice importantly, when we're writing code like this, we cannot say else. There is no, you can, it's not allowed that you're allowed to give an else block to this. Because you don't know if M does not accept W. Perhaps this step that says simulate M and W, that might be a step that takes infinitely long. So then you'll never not accept, right? You'll, you'll, you'll never know because halt is undecidable. So ATM is undecidable, um, but ATM is recognizable. Uh, what about the complement of ATM? Recognizable? What do we think? The complement of ATM cannot be recognizable because the complement, if a language and its complement are recognizable, then the language is decidable, right? So ATM is not recognizable. We proved this last time, right? If L and L complement are recognizable, you can dovetail the execution of the recognizers and you build a decider contradiction, right? Um, right? So ATM is basically halt. It's basically the same as halt. But it'll end up being more useful in proofs today. Now, we proved halt to be undecidable by diagonalization. But we're going to generalize kind of the idea we brought here and bring in this idea of a many-one reduction or a mapping reduction. Uh, to, we can prove a large family of classes to be undecidable. A lot of problems are undecidable simply by relating them to problems that we know are already undecidable. That's basically what a reduction is. Recall f for a function of strings to strings is uh, Turing computable or simply computable if uh, there exists a Turing machine uh, to halt on all inputs begins with W on its tape halts only with f of w on its tape. A function is said to be computable or Turing computable if there exists a Turing machine to compute it on all inputs. By compute, the machine takes on input f of w, excuse me, takes on input w, writes down f of w, and halts. And the machine halts on all inputs, right? We gave some examples of, uh, of such problems on the homework. Um, for uh, a B, any languages, we say uh, A is many one reducible to B, or mapping reducible because it's the many one kind of is fell out of fashion because there's not really many to one anymore. It's just it's just a kind of function. Uh, if there exists a computable function 
uh, f such that uh, w is in a if and only if f of w is in b. Equivalently, w is not in a if and only if f of w is not in b. This computable function is a reduction. It, in some sense, preserves the correctness property, but transforms you from one instance of problem A to one instance of problem B. You should always keep this picture in your mind. Every string is either in A or not in A, right? So this is A complement. This is A. This is a B complement. And this is B, right? So every string is either in A or not in A. The reduction maps every string that's in A to some string in B, perhaps not so bijectively. And every string that's not in A is mapped to some string not in B, also perhaps not bijectively. But the mapping does not cross the lines. Good goes to good and bad goes to bad. That's exactly how you should think of the reduction, right? You might be fresh out of 3510. You might recall seeing the definition of a polynomial, uh, a polynomial time reduction. What is the only difference between this definition of a reduction and a polynomial time reduction? Computable function need not be computable in polynomial time. The difference between a polynomial time reduction and, and a many one reduction is that this one is computable at all. The polynomial time reduction must be computable in a polynomial time. The reduction has to be efficient. It can't take too long. This is you could do whatever. In fact, this polynomial time reduction is a special case of this reduction, the many one reduction, right? Now, the reduction, although we didn't give a reduction from halt, we didn't give a many one reduction, excuse me, from uh, halt to ATM, we still were able to relate the hardness. Uh, the reduction allows us to relate the hardness of A and B. Um, if you have a uh, many one reducible to B, Um, then the following are true. Of B is decidable. That implies A is decidable. The contrapositive of that is that if A is undecidable, that implies B is undecidable. Right? So if you choose some, if you want to prove some language undecidable, choose some known undecidable language A and prove a reduction from A to B. Similarly, uh, if B is recognizable, that implies A is recognizable. And the contrapositive can help you prove that a language is not even recognizable. If uh, A is unrecognizable, that implies B is unrecognizable. That means unrecognizable, again, means does not even have a, a semi-decider for it. An algorithm is decidable if there's an algorithm for it, says yes and no correctly in all inputs. An algorithm is semi-decidable or recognizable if there exists an algorithm that says yes on the good inputs and then waivers on the, on the bad inputs. A language is unrecognizable if it doesn't even have a half decider, right? A semi decider. Give me, do you, we have an example of an unrecognizable language already. What is it? The complement of yeah. ATM. Complement of ATM is unrec unrecognizable, right? Um, right. I'm only going to prove the first one, the others can be proved similarly. We'll prove that if B is decidable, then A is decidable. So if, uh, if, uh, there's a many one reduction from A to B, and uh, B is decidable, then A is decidable. Uh, we give decider for A as follows. Uh, we'll call it DEC for A on input W. It's going to compute uh, F of W. If F of W is an element of B, except 
else reject. So again, the reduction is computable. The reduction function is computable. There, it's something that halts on all inputs right, by assumption. So this reduction can be done in some finite number of steps. Okay? Then you just give f of w to the decider for b. Recall when I say f of w and b, I'm using a shorthand here. By assumption to the contrary, a decider exists for b. Give f of w to that decider. If the reduction is correct and b is decidable, then he, this is a correct algorithm to decide a. Again, why does it work? Take w, it's in a, compute f of w, decide if it's in b or not in b. This over here is decidable, so this over here has to be decidable because the transformation is correct. Right? Now, it doesn't need to be a bijection or anything like that. It just simply has to preserve the correctness. Right? Yes? Great question. And the first time I taught this course in 2021, I did the entire lecture with the symbol reversed. Uh, Terrible typo, and I have dreams about that sometimes. Essentially, what you should think about is that there's an imaginary uh, Cartesian plane that looks like this. Okay, here is the uh, regular languages. Here's the context-free languages. And being more rightward means being more unsolvable. Right? You can't really say more unsolvable, but suppose you could, right? Here, of course, there's things in between here, but here we have LTM and we have uh, L star TM. Right? So you can think of A greater than or equal to B, A less than or equal to B, means on this scale, and of course it doesn't work if you reorient yourself, which is why you have to pretend that things are going rightward. A is here somewhere, B can be here somewhere, right? But if A is here somewhere, then B is, of course, to the right of it, wherever that is. That's the best way to think of it. Um, if you were to draw a block diagram, it wouldn't obviously be clear because B would be smaller in that picture than A. But that's just sort of what we do, right? So if A is undecidable, let's suppose A is over here. Then B must be more undecidable. More undecidable, whatever that means, right? That's the way to think about the direction. The only way to think about the direction, right? Questions? All right. Um, let me give you another example of an undecidable problem. Uh, we proved halt was undecidable. We proved ATM was undecidable. Let's prove ETM is undecidable. ETM is the emptiness problem. This is the set of Turing machines, M, such that M either loops or rejects all strings. Right? M decides nothing. There is not a single string that can bring these machines to accept. Okay? ETM. You should perhaps start developing an intuition that actually this is also undecidable for the same reasons that ATM is undecidable, right? Same reasons that all those other things are undecidable. We will prove it by giving a reduction from ATM to ETM complement. For complicated reasons, that is an exercise in the Sipser book. We can't actually give a direct, a direct reduction from ATM to ETM. That's OK. We can actually give a reduction from ATM to ETM complement. We will prove that ETM complement is undecidable. And therefore, the complement of it must also be undecidable. Right? A complement, a language, if a language is, is undecidable, but its complement is decidable, then take the complement again. It's decidable. It's contradiction. Right? So this is sufficient for us to prove that ETM is undecidable. Determine if there is, given a machine, if there exists any string that brings that machine to accept. Undecidable problem. Right? Questions on, this, on the language, on the, on the problem, before we get into the reduction itself? Is this believable, by the way? I mean, like, halt may have been unbelievable. But if you assume halt to be true, and you should, would you expect this language to be undecidable? Intuition-wise? No? All right, what is the language again? It consists of pr strings. Each string is the code of a machine. The description, the encoding, the Godel numbering, th the index, whatever, the code of the machine. It is the description of the machine. But 
it contains a description, machines, desc machine descriptions that have something about the property of the machines. The machines don't accept any strings. That means for each machine in this language, the machine either rejects all inputs, loops on all inputs, rejects or loops some combination of inputs, right? Such a, it, there's not, no machine in this language has a single string that'll bring it to accept. Yes? It's not like a random question to bring up now, but um, the encode, all these languages are like with respect to some encoding, right? Okay. Yes. The encoding is, I'm assuming, a standard way to cast, if you were to write a two-string function, to cast a struct. Like a Turing machine is some struct, q, sigma, gamma, whatever. Cast that to a two-string function, it always will be some string. You can argue about the typewriter principle accountability properties, but certainly there's some unique way to do it. Right. Um, yes, and there's other certain other, there's many other encodings as well. Yeah. I have a semi-related question about yes. reduction idea. About the what? Reduction idea. Of course, yes. Today's about reductions, yeah. Okay. So, um, can you, like, you're using this framework, like, decision problems? Yes. Does this framework allow for, like, so there is a, um, in the theory of NP-completeness, there is a transformation that is preserved from the search decision framework. If there exists an efficient search algorithm, there exists an efficient decision algorithm. As an efficient decision algorithm is an efficient search algorithm and vice versa with only a linear overhead. So like polynomial is still polynomial, exponential is still exponential. Here, I don't think that there is such a thing. Um, because we're not talking about efficiency, we're talking about unsolvability. There should not be a problem in which the search problem is decidable, but a decision variant is not, right? I'll also mention that these are also worded specifically in general, right? Certain subcases may be decidable, right? Halting, you can always find this sub, an infinite subset of it is always decidable. You can just like control F if the machine has a random while true in there, and there's infinitely many machines that should. So that's a decidable subproblem. Every, uh, of course, in experience, you, everyone has written code and been like, why is my browser laggy all of a sudden? And then you're like, oh, I put an infinite loop in my code on accident. You debugged the while loop out of it, right? The, 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 you, de you debugged the infinite for loop out of it, whatever. Um, so certain cases, it's actually mechanically decidable, certain subcases. But in general, it cannot be. Why? Assume to the contrary it was. Construct D, run it on its own code. You can diagonalize out. Is there a way to find like a large space of decidable subset? There was a paper by, a, I think he's graduating now, a PhD student who worked with Kieran Zhang. He had a paper about, and we'll talk about Rice's theorem after this, but like. Yeah, like Kieran Zhang here? Yes. His PhD student was named Shuo Ding. He had a paper where he tried to approximate how decidable could an undecidable problem be, because he was concerned with the concept of program testing. Like, and we'll talk about this actually more in the second half. But he was concerned with this, and he showed um, kind of you can do good heuristically, but not really, because, again, it's still undecidable problems exist. You can do good, but you can't do too good, because if you start doing too good, then you've reached a contradiction, something like this. So there is work on this area, modern work as well. Right. More questions? We'll generalize this whole thing, but let's give it a, a good example of a, of, of a reduction. Um, Here's what our uh, reduction function is going to be. It needs to take as input uh, m comma w, and it needs to output some uh, machine m prime, right? Notice that the descriptions here is a single machine. It's not a machine in word. It's a different syntax. The, the, the reduction needs to take on a, a machine in word and output a machine m prime, OK? The reduction is going to write down the following code, m prime on input x. And it's going to have M and W hard-coded. Now, importantly, this M prime we're writing down is never run. This is an algorithm. F is an algorithm which writes code. But it doesn't ever run that code. We're playing with the limits of computation. Programs are simulating each other. Some programs are writing code, to, which is never run. But that's fine. So f here is writing this code, right? You can believe you could write a Python program to concatenate strings and write out a Python program, right? Um, 
simulate m on w. If m accepts w, m prime accepts x. So basically, m prime is going to run m on w, OK? And if m accepts w, which are hard coded, it's going to accept its input. Now, the behavior of m prime on x, which is just the name of the input in the function header, the, the behavior of m prime on x on all inputs is dependent upon the behavior of m on a specific input. Now, it's important that m prime is never run. OK? m prime is, m prime is just constructed. It's simply written down by the function f. OK? Now, why does this work? Suppose that uh, m comma w is in ATM. If m comma w is in ATM, we know what that means. We know that m accepts w, right? But if m accepts w, we know that this if statement is hit. So we know that m prime will accept x. So what is the language of m prime? If m accepts w, what strings do m, does m prime accept? Everything. So it's sigma star. But if l, if, if l of m prime is equal to sigma star, we know that the code of m prime is not an element of etm. Right? Let's do the reduction the other way, just for clarity. Suppose m comma w is not an element of atm. If m comma w is not an element of atm, what do we know? We know that m rejects w or m loops on w. Either way, this if statement is never ran. That means m prime either loops on its input or m prime either rejects or doesn't accept, it definitely doesn't accept its input, right? So we know that means that L of m prime doesn't accept anything. So it's the empty set. But that's true if and only if. Um, L, uh, the code of m prime is an element of etm by definition. So we see that m comma w is an atm if and only if uh, m prime, by the way, which is the output f of m comma w, is an element is not an element of etm. This is exactly a reduction from ATM to ETM, complement, QED. Questions on that reduction? You could rephrase it always in a contra proof by contradiction, every reduction. But sometimes it's OK not to, and maybe it's clear one way or the other. You could say, assume to the contrary, ETM complement was decidable. We give a decider for ATM as follows. Contradiction. But it would just be this reduction composed with this proof we did here, where A mapping reducible to B, B is decidable, A is decidable, right? It would just be a repetition of that. Questions on this reduction? Since AT, ETM complement is undecidable, ETM must be undecidable. And it's in, undecidable in general to determine if a machine accepts anything. Is there a single string which will bring this machine to accept? I don't know. We don't know. Provably so, algorithmically unsolvable. Questions on that one? Why, why do we need to reduce to ETM complement? Yeah. It's complicated. You can, it's basically like a reduction cannot map. Uh, notice that the reduction must map good to good and bad to bad. You cannot actually, A and B in the reduction definition are not allowed to be empty or sigma star. I see. Because the, you can't, the, the, a set and its complement must be, both be non-empty for the reduction to be correct. I see. So those, those are the only two languages you can't map. For a similar reason, the proof of, you can try and prove, assume to the contrary, but you have a reduction from ATM to ETM complement, ATM, you'll work out something like that. It's an exercise. Certainly this machine works, but it's not obvious to create a machine that has the complementary behavior. Yeah. Right? You kind of, acceptance goes one way. Notice here, again, we can never say else. We say if M accepts W, it's impossible for us to say else because we don't know if M doesn't accept W. You could have if M rejects W, but what use would that be, right? 
In fact, this technique that we've done here for ETM is really general, and it'll work on basically everything. Construct this machine M prime to do uh, exactly something only if M accepts W, right? The behavior becomes conditional on M accepting W. So if someone comes up to you, they say, I can determine always if a machine ac accepts any string. And you go, really? Well, here's this string. Try this one. And that machine, you've hacked it to have a, an encoding of M and W. So he'll tell you if M accepts W or not. right? He won't even realize that. He can solve the acceptance problem for you if he claims he can solve the emptiness problem for you. right? Let's do another one. Uh, EQTM is a semantic equality of programs. M1, M2, it's encoding of pairs of Turing machines such that the Turing machines agree on all inputs. On the inputs that are n they don't agree on, they may reject or loop on them separately. Right? They don't necessarily halt on all inputs. But this is called EQTM. It's a set of strings such that uh, they are equivalent. Now, this is an undecidable language, as, of course, that's the point of this lecture. Well, this is, in fact, a more interesting undecidable language because, again, we can make uh, great analogies to program testing. Have you ever thought about when you write code, you have to do, like, if you refactor or whatever, I don't know how to program, you do one of those things, you have to write 10,000 unit tests. Have you ever thought about why you have to write 10,000 unit tests? You can't just have a proof that two programs are semantically equivalent is because it's undecidable in general. The best thing you can do is cope and try to write 10,000 unit tests that cover all possible cases. You can't, in general, given two programs, here, two Turing machines, given the description of two Turing machines, determine the behavior of them on infinitely many inputs, if they're identical or not. In fact, EQTM is a much more undecidable problem in general. We'll prove that later today. But EQTM is undecidable. Why? Actually, the proof is fairly simple. We will prove EQTM is undecidable by doing a reduction. When you prove a language is undecidable and you choose a problem to reduce from, you always want to choose the simplest one. So what is in a language you would choose from to reduce? This is, I think, a hard question for us right now. But what is a language you would choose to reduce from? ETM. ETM. I like the intersection. Well, we proved ETM is undecidable because ETM complement is undecidable. So it's OK for us to assume ETM complement is undecidable or, or ETM. So we'll, in fact, just prove ETM. There's a reduction from ETM to EQTM. So what does this mean? We want some F. We want if some M is in ETM for some M1, M2 to be in EQTM, and a reduction function should take on input a single machine and output a pair of machines M1, uh, comma M2, right? So here's what our reduction is going to do. It's going to program uh, let M1 uh, on input X uh, be as follows. Um, it's going to have ah, yes. We're simply going to set this to be uh, M1 to be M and M2 to be, we'll call it M empty set, such that the empty set machine rejects all strings, right? This is going to be, uh, so like a M empty set on input, we'll call it X, reject. So L, M empty set is just the empty set, right? If, uh, let's suppose M is an element of ETM, then the language of M Uh, is equal to the empty set, but that implies that that is equal to the language of M empty set, which implies that uh, M comma M empty set are an element of EQTM. 
uh, if m is not an element of ETM, that is true if and only if L of m is not the empty set. But that's, that implies that L of m does not equal L of m empty set, right? Which, impl which, which implies that m comma m empty set is not an element of ETM. Although it's phrased in this kind of uh, crazy way, it's just, the, it's just you can determine zero-ness if you can determine equality. Def is zero. Turn n equal equal zero. Okay? If you can determine equality, you can determine zero-ness, emptiness, right? So this is sufficient for us to give a reduction from ETM to EQTM. So EQTM is undecidable for the same reason that ETM is undecidable. Right? Yes? I wanted to work on like figuring out the way the reductions work. It's like we're reducing from one thing to another. It's not always true that if you have a reduction from A to B, then you have one from B to A. Correct. Absolutely. In fact, I would challenge you to give a reduction from a decidable problem to halt. That doesn't tell you anything. The reverse is the only way that tells you something. Here's an example of a reduction. If A is decidable, decide it. If it's good, return a machine that always halts. If it's wrong, return the uh, machine that always loops. Single out, two possible outputs only. Not a nice or interesting reduction, but certainly a reduction. Uh, but it doesn't help us because A, by assumption, was decidable. Only when we have the flipped is it decidable. Here, we're assuming we're going from ETM to EQTM. And because we know ETM is undecidable, EQTM must be undecidable. That's the way it works. All right. More questions on this one? So when we do a reduction, we're basically saying, like, A is at least as hard, or B is at least as hard as A. Yeah. Hardness is a complexity and not a computability term, because that's what we did in the theory of NP completeness. It was a measure of hardness, a, uh, an ordering of hardness. Partial ordering, at least. This is a unsolvableness, which is, again, you can't say really say more unsolvable, less unsolvable, or something. It's either solvable or unsolvable. That's sort of what we're doing with. Yeah, recognizable or unrecognizable. All right. Um, let's talk another, uh, a little bit more about reductions. We have one further question that you may have asked yourself, which is, let me give you a, a world map first. So this is everything we've ever done ever. At the bottom, primordially, we have finite languages, right? These are include what? The empty set. I don't know, sigma, sigma 7, whatever, right? Finite languages. Every finite language is regular, but not every regular language is finite. So we have a class of languages like LDFA, uh, LNFA, etc. This contains like A star. A, B, star, whatever, right? Simple combinatory languages, things that are like pattern matching string algorithm stuff, really trivial. Then we have the context-free languages. PDA, we know those, those are equivalent. This contains like A to the N, B to the N, the Dick language, and so on, right? Uh, parentheses, and so on. Um, then from there, we kind of had a little sliver of a language, which is called L, a context-sensitive. We didn't talk about much in that, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. Um, I would consider it relatively thin. Then we had the decidable languages, but I'll present it this way. We had the recognizable languages, and we had the co-recognizable languages. So uh, we have uh, we have L, uh, T, M to be the decidable languages. We have L star T, M to be the uh, recognizable languages. And we'll define co 
uh, L star C. And co basically means you take the complement of the elements of the class, but not the class itself. So uh, co TM is what are called co recognizable. And it's the complements of the recognizable languages. So we say L is in co, co uh, L is co recognizable uh, if and only if uh, L complement is recognizable. Right? So we can call that class co recognizable languages. Here we'll put the recognizable languages. And here we'll put the co recognizable languages. Right? I've, and here we'll put the decidable languages. Why is it true that the decidable languages are the intersection of the recognizable and the co recognizable? If you can recognize the language and its complement, then you just build a Turing machine which simulates both like dovetail together. Exactly. The, the intersection, in fact, of the complement and the uh, of the co-recognizable and the recognizable languages is exactly and only the decidable languages. Note that I'll just make a reference. This is not known to be true for P and NP. We'll talk about this later. We know P looks like this, and then we have NP that looks like this, and then we have co-NP, which looks like this. But we don't know if NP is equal to co-NP. There may be a little space there. But we'll get a similar structure when we talk about complexity theory. P is in between both. We don't know what's equal to the intersection exactly. There may be a gap. We don't know this. We don't know this yet, though. Um, here we can put all the decidable problems, primes. And in fact, this is, by the church Turing thesis, our definition of an algorithm, right? That's sort of the, the lip of the world. Um, what other, anything that has an algorithm for it is in LD, uh, LTM, right? We were able to give, by diagonalization, some undecidable problems. We were able to put halt is recognizable and ATM is recognizable, and we knew that the complements of those were not recognizable. But in fact, by definition, the complements of them are co-recognizable, right? And so on. You could put every language we've ever talked about can go somewhere on this chart, somewhere on this picture. The question you should have is, does there exist anything out here? We were able to prove that halt complement was not recognizable. So if you generalize the definition of an algorithm to be those which include semi-decidable languages, which you shouldn't do, but if you were so lenient as to do so, you would still construct languages which could not be decidable. Halt, excuse me, could not be recognizable. Halt, complement, cannot be recognizable because halt is recognizable. And if they're both recognizable, then they're, it's decidable, contradiction. But does there exist, if we define co-recognizable languages in this way, we can get all the complements of the recognizable languages. Does, is every language recognizable or co-recognizable? Does there exist anything outside of there? Right? First off, why is, is this true? Why, is, why does there exist a language which is neither recognizable nor co-recognizable? There's two proofs today. We'll do a, a constructive one and a non-constructive one. Give me a non-constructive argument about why a non-recognizable and non-co-recognizable, a language which is not recognizable and not co-recognizable must exist. The answer I'm looking for is counting. The recognizable languages and by extension, the co-recognizable languages are a countable subset because there's a correspondence with them to Turing machines. So of course they must be account. This whole picture is simply from one small countable subset. Here's the power set of sigma star. This whole thing is just a tiny, tiny dot. It's just a little bit of the universe. Everything else is undecidable, right? Uh, not even recognizable, not even co recognizable. There's infinitely many more problems than there are even half algorithms, semi deciders for them, right? So, first off, by accounting arguments, such languages must exist. Do there exist any interesting languages that have definable definitions? As in, like, is there a, a set builder notation for such a language? And also, it's not recognizable and co recognizable. Perhaps a more interesting question. And it turns out, yes, there exists a language who, such that it and its complement are both unrecognizable, and it would be EQTM. EQTM and EQTM complement are both unrecognizable. 
in some sense, they're not recognizable and they're not co-recognizable. What this really means is that EQTM, in some sense, is a way more unsolvable problem than EQTM because there does not exist even a semi-decider for it or its complement. So in some sense, it's way more unsolvable than ETM, ATM, whatever. But can, how much can you really put a measure on that of more un, unsolvable? Um, we at least know it's not recognizable, not co-recognizable. So we'll prove uh, that to be true. All right. Any questions on what we're about to prove, why we did it this way, anything like that? Uh, first, we show that EQTM, which one am I doing? EQTM is unrecognizable. We're going to actually, instead of, so the Sipster book actually proves this using a uh, reduction, but we can actually do it without a reduction simpler. Um, there's a few parts of the reduction calculus that we can actually use without having to actually give the reduction itself. First, note that if A is mapping reducible to B, that's true if and only if A complement is mapping reducible to B complement. Why is this true? Reverse the, like you just use the same function essentially. You just change what good and good and bad and bad are. The reduction will take good to good and bad to bad. You just change. The bad, what you call bad, you just change it to good. And now it returns good to good and bad to bad still. Right. Yes? I want to make sure, when you say like A reduces to B, you're basically saying like if you can compute B, then you can compute A. If you can, well, I'll say even if you can decide B, you can decide A, yes. Now, the contrapositive of that is that if A is undecidable, then so is B. If A is unrecognizable, usefully so, then so is B. Right. Then we'll, we'll, next we'll prove uh, reductions are transitive. If you have a many one reduction from A to B, and you have a many redu one reduction from B to C, why do you have a many one reduction from A to C? Why is the reduction transitive? It's like function composition. Basically. The composition of computable functions is computable. Take the function from A to B, then you'll have f of w, and then apply g of f of w. So let's say f goes from A to B, g goes from B to C. Then uh, is it uh, g of f of w uh, goes from A to C, right? Preserving the correctness. Good goes to good goes to good. Bad goes to bad goes to bad. Um, so we can actually prove that uh, EQTM is unrecognizable in a simpler way. We want to prove, now we choose some unrecognizable language, ATM complement. If we could prove that, that would be sufficient for us to show that EQTM is unrecognizable, right? So what we're going to do is just take the reductions we, we had. We proved that ATM is mapping reducible to ETM complement. We proved that. So that implies that there is a reduction from ATM complement mapping reducible to ETM. Right? And we gave a reduction from ETM to EQTM. Compose that reduction with that reduction, we'll get out a reduction from ATM complement to ET EQTM. Therefore, EQTM is unrecognizable. It would be a good exercise for you to come up with the reduction itself. It's not too challenging. But we don't need to. Good part about calculus is in symbolic manipulation. Just throw, throw some, some, some algebraic law at it, and then bam, bing, bang, boom. Right. Questions? All right, next we need to prove 
that EQTM uh, is also uncorecognizable, as in EQTM complement is also unrecognizable. There does not exist a recognizer for EQTM. We'll prove there doesn't even exist a recognizer for when two machines are not equivalent, right? We we'll prove that by saying EQ. Uh, we want to prove that EQTM is unrec complement is unrecognizable, right? And again, to prove unrecognizability, you prove a reduction from ATM complement to EQTM complement. But this is again true if and only if ATM ATM is mapping reducible to EQTM, right? So we will simply give a reduction from ATM to EQTM. Questions on that? Why that's true, what we're about to show? So here's our reduction. Our reduction is going to take down input uh, m, comma, w. And it's going to output a pair of machines, m1, m2, such that uh, um, M comma W is in ATM if and only if um, M1, M2 are elements of EQTM, right? F is going to proceed as follows. Build M sigma star to accept all strings. In fact, it doesn't need to build uh, sigma, it doesn't need to build m sigma star. It may simply have m sigma star hard coded. Uh, build m prime hard coded from m and w. Return uh, m prime m sigma star. Now we need to we need to describe what sigma star m, excuse me m prime looks like m prime on input x has hard coded m and w. So again, these are two constants that have been hard coded into the machine. The code of another machine m, which is something, and its input m, simulate uh, m on w. If m accepts w. Except X. You may be familiar with this machine. This is the same one we used in the reduction for ETM, right? Notice the behavior of M prime on infinitely many inputs depends upon the behavior on M on W, one input. So someone says, uh, I can determine if your machine accepts any strings or all strings. Well, guess what? Uh, then you better be, you can trick that guy into telling you that he can determine if M accepts W at all, right? So we'll give the reduction. Suppose that M comma W is in ATM. That's true if and only if um, L of M prime accepts all strings, so sigma star. But that's true if and only if uh, M prime comma uh, M sigma star is an element of EQTM. Right? Let's give the reduction the other way. If M comma W is not in ATM, then M loops or, re or rejects W. It loops on W, M loops on W, M rejects W, whatever. But we know that L of M prime does not accept any strings then. Because this, if it loops, this M prime will loop. If it rejects, then it does not accept, so it just exits. So we say M prime does not accept any strings. So this is the empty string, excuse me, the empty set. But then that means that L of M prime, excuse me, M prime and M sigma star are not equal. So therefore, m prime, m sigma star are not equivalent. And therefore, that string is not in EQTM. This is sufficient for us to prove that EQTM complement itself is unrecognizable, just like ET EQTM is unrecognizable. Right. Questions on that? Yes? Uh, you kind of gave like a Python function where you showed like how we're using a quality to show if it's zero. Are you able to do something similar for this? Um, you can determine. When we come back from the break, I'll talk about Rice's theorem and a generalization of every single proof. Because unlike the theory of NP-completeness, where there's diversity in what the creativity required in certain reductions, for program style, for Turing machine properties, actually all the reductions look the same. 
Um, and notice that you're basically getting con your one machine writes the code of another machine, and that code is never ran. But it's important that the code, ha if it were run, would do whatever m on w does, right? The behavior of m prime is conditional upon the behavior of m. I was wondering how we're using like equality to figure out if the two machines are. Ah, so the two machines are equal. You fix a point to them. You fix one of the two machines, so it's no, no longer a pair of machines. The machine that's fixed accepts all strings. So you have another machine, m prime, which m prime can do two things. L of m prime is equal to either it accepts all strings or doesn't accept all strings. So you know this is either equal to the empty set or sigma star. Which one of those it's equal to is conditional upon if m accepts w. So if you can determine if it's sigma star or not, you can actually determine if m accepts w. It's a hack, but it works. Yes? For situations like this, is there like a lighter form of reduction? Because like we're proving unrecognizability, so we really don't need the if and only if when we are considering the function. Like all we need is that accepting strings map to accepting strings and reject like rejecting or looping strings just kind of do whatever. No, you don't you should not want a rejecting or looping machine to map to a correct input. Yeah, yeah, but like the, as long that they don't necessarily need to map like rejecting to rejecting. It can be correct. Like rejecting or looping to like something that is just not. Accepted. It could even be a malformed, not correct syntax of a Turing machine, right? The complement of a set, for example, the complement of EQTM does not simply contain pairs of machines which do not map, which are not equal. It also contains strings that are not Turing machines. The empty string would be an EQTM complement. Excuse me. Yeah. Right. But which string do you map it to? You don't. You can't even decide ATM. Yet you can compute a reduction on ATM. The, com the reduction is computable even though ATM is not. Yeah. That's very. That's kind of important, and why the reduction is such a powerful tool. Now, without that, the theory of reductions would become trivial. But need the reduction be computable, or just like? Yes, the reduction need definitely need to be computable. Or does it only need to be computable on accepting strings? Um, well, because on, re on rejecting here's a, re here's a reduction that's computable that doesn't have the property you have. Mm, we can always determine finite elements, a few elements that are both in and not in every language, even those are decidable or not, right? Fix one string that is in EQTM and map all of ATM to that one string. Yeah. On input anything, return this fixed constant string. That is not a reduction, though. It doesn't preserve the correctness that we desire. And the proof, uh, you know, good goes to good, bad goes to bad. Yeah, yeah. But you only need good goes to good here. Um, like what fact, about if what if you did good and bad goes to good? But like that would just okay. You, I guess you need you need good goes to good and bad does not go to good. But bad need not need good go to bad. Bad can just go to like loop forever. I yeah. It's recognizability. So like our, our I guess like what I'm saying is that F need not be Turing computable. It need to be some sort of thing where like it is computable on accepting inputs, but can do whatever it wants. I'm rejecting inputs as long as it doesn't map to something that is accepting um, on the right side. Like on the right when side. we prove the correctness of a reduction, you want to have the fact that the reduction halts on all inputs. You don't want to generalize the reduction to be one which is uh, a notion of recognizability. For the kind of for the same reason, you don't want a polytime reduction to consider do a little bit of exponential time work because the definition of the reduction has to be simpler than the objects that are being translated, right? When you do reductions within P, you do a logarithmic space reduction and so on. The definition of reduction must be far simpler than the class of objects you're reducing from. So you can show a, a, a notion of undecidability, but the reduction definition has to be decidable, the definition of the reduction. Yes. Yes. It has to be computable. Otherwise, I claim you could find a counterexample where you could prove some undecidable language is decidable or something by the, having the reduction take care of the undecidable part for you. But in the case that we're only using the reduction to demonstrate unrecognizability, then we can leverage the fact that we can be exactly as hard as the class we're moving over. You might not get some of the nice algebraic stuff then that you want. Okay. Like the A complement goes to B complement, if and only if A goes to B. You okay. might not get that. You might not get transitivity, because how do you know if bad is mapped to bad? Yeah. What if bad, bad loops? There's nothing is returned for the composition to occur, and so on. Okay. It's a very carefully constructed definition, but in certain cases, of course, you can argue in general. When we, at the beginning of class, we didn't actually prove a reduction from halt to ATM. That was just a proof by contradiction. It was called actually a different kind of reduction, called a Turing reduction, not a many one reduction. So there are certain variants. I think for complexity, I, I know of at least 13 different kinds of reduction. Carp reduction, Cook reduction, um, Levin reduction, 
parsimonious reduction, t truth table reduction, all these uh, log space randomized BPP, or whatever. You know, there's a diversity here. And I'm sure that that specific reduction would prove exactly one specific problem. But a better person would come up with a more strict <laughs> definition of reduction, right? Yeah, all right. Well, not, be not better, but yeah, I mean, it's like a, a, a be better mathematical theory. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. All right, more questions? Excellent. Let's take our little break.